Now, um, those of you that, uh, who receives the regular email that comes around on a, I think it's a Friday, great. Um, I have to confess, I don't always read it in detail, uh, but to, uh, did read the one, big shout out for Brent. I think he did a fantastic um, piece in there about, yeah, big call out for Brent, yes. It's all about church membership, and I think it's well worth, if you have deleted it or not read it, go back and reread the, the message, because we all get swamped with email messages, right? But go back and reread it. It's a great reminder about the benefits of church membership. Um, now, a few things to say. First of all, we have our summer interns. Uh, we're hiring a crew of young men and women aged 16 or over to join for the summer. And so if you think that you are that person or you think you know someone, please reach out to them. Um, and in the past, we've had some great success with uh, projects that have been done and having fun and building friendships all at the same time. So, so please, if you're interested, send your resume. Uh, or in my part of the world, we call it a CV. Send it to the uh, office, office at dbicc.org. Daniel, is Daniel still here? He's, uh, he's, there he is. Okay, well, Daniel, as you may know, is sadly leaving us, but there's a drop-in farewell for him at the church office on the 30th of June between 6 to 8. What day of the week is that? Anyone know? Friday. It's a Friday. Okay, so fantastic Friday, but it's not that fantastic because Daniel's leaving, but you know what I mean. Please come in and uh, drop in, and he'd love to, to, to see you there between 6 and 8 on the 30th. And um, anyone here like dancing? Oh, a few of you. Okay, good. Well, we're moving to the dance studio. Okay, so uh, around this, Dave has just given me a guided tour. There's a, a dance studio around here, or in fact, obviously, you come through the top, drop down the steps. There's a dance studio, and that's where we'll be having our services in July. So there's no excuse not to be dancing during the worship. Uh, so that's, yeah, just a reminder that during July we will be in the dance studio. And of course, what a great chance, again, to bring your friends along. Because, uh, you know, it's a time when people leave. So peop your friends have got nothing to do because all their friends have left. So those that are still here, bring them along to church. Okay. And after the service, there'll be a chance to have a good old chit-chat with your friends. Because outside, we're going to be having nibbles, tea and coffee. Is that right, Kristen? So please stay on, have a chat. It's a bit cooler today, I notice, after the rain. So come and stay, have a coffee, and share with your uh, fellow members of the church. So great. And uh, now, all that leaves to remain is the offering. So I think there are a couple of people coming to help out with the offering. Uh, so if I could invite you to come down. And uh, there we go, gentlemen, thank you. We have an offering bag down here. So let's just pray for our offering. Thank you. Great. Okay, let's just pray. Lord, you bless us and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray that uh, you will lay on our hearts uh, a generous giving spirit uh, so that we can not just enable the church to survive, but to flourish in Discovery Bay. In your name, Lord Jesus, thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The dead of night and you tell me That you're pleased in that I Never alone You're a good, good father It's who you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers for Okay, thank you. Now, now 
now, before we hand over to the man that needs no introduction, we're going to watch a short video clip. <clears throat> Dad, I'm just going to say it. I don't know why it's hard for me to talk real with you, but it is. And all we ever do is talk weather and sports and sports and weather, and that's it. I don't know. What I really want to say is I'm thankful for how you loved me growing up, and you always made time for me, and I love you. Happy Father's Day. That was really good. You think? Yeah, you need to tighten it up a little bit, but other than that, you're ready. Okay, thanks, Uncle Ron. Here goes. Good. Dad. Son. <sighs> Looks like the uh, clouds are rolling in. Yeah, hope they don't postpone the game tonight. Listen, Dad, I wanted, to, I wanted to say something to you. OK. Just, I just want to thank of you for, for, well, thank you for being, you know, a, a dad. Not, not just a dad, you know, being, for being one that's mine and not, well, of course, not just mine. You're Jessica and Jordan's dad, too. But it's, it's cool. Matthew. I, I, yes, sir. I know. Dad, I, I don't think you do know. No, oh, no, I know. I heard you talking to Uncle Ron. I was sitting just four feet from you. Well, I meant it. Thank you. Great reminder, thank you. And uh, yeah, wonderful. Now here we have one of the great dads in our church. Uh, we've got Dave <laughs> speaking. Uh, I'm saying that because his children have gone. <laughs> um, but Dave, before we hear your message, I'm just going to pray for you. Thank you. Um, Lord, we thank you for Dave. We thank you for all that he does behind the scenes. And we thank you for his leadership. We thank you for his role as a father. And we're just really excited to hear what he has to say today. Lord, through him, release your words so that we can be encouraged this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Trevor. Is it just me, or did Uncle Ron look like Pastor McGee? I thought that was him. <laughs> How many of you are fathers? Well, it's more than I thought. Grandfathers? All right, well... Today's message is going to hopefully address not only the fathers and grandfathers, but everyone uh, who is here. As most of you know, I have three children of my own, Dorcas, Barnabas, and Hope. And uh, one of my responsibilities, I always feel as a father, is to provide guidance to them, uh, hopefully navigating them uh, to God's calling and God's desire for each of them. I don't know exactly what it's going to be, um, but I do know God will make the right choice, recognizing that each of them is very unique. Uh, I wanted to tell you a story about one of my children, and I did get his permission before, uh, before telling you this. Uh, when Barnabas uh, was three years old, Sarah and I were very surprised to learn that Barnabas had a plan for his life. Well, actually, I was very surprised that he had a plan. As a three-year-old, you don't have plans. I remember when I was five, my dad used to come up to me and he said, you know, the plan that you and your brothers have every day is to wake up, watch cartoons, have lunch, watch more cartoons, go play ball, have dinner, take a quick shower, watch more TV, and then go to sleep. That's your idea of a great day. And I think I was like five or six when my dad told me that. So I remember 
when Barnabas was three, and yes, we probably just finished watching TV. I don't remember what program we were watching. But I asked Barnabas, I said, hey, Barnabas, what do you, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'm thinking, what do three-year-old kids want to do? I said, do you want to be a fireman? He said, no. Oh, I know. In California, he loves the garbage trucks. They have these side-loading garbage trucks where the fork comes down from the side. And you, know, you don't need two operators. You only need one guy driving it. And it, as he drives it up next to your trash can, the fork comes down, lifts it up, throws it overhead, and then goes on to the next home. And Barnabas used to love those. And if I were, if I were driving, Dad, he would be saying, Dad, Dad, look, there's a garbage truck over there. And I'm going, wow, he really likes these. I said, Barnabas, do you want to be a garbage man? And he said, no. Oh, thank God, no. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know. Do you want to be what all the other Asian parents want their kids to be, a doctor or a lawyer? He goes, no. I said, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be a pastor. I said, what? <laughs> so what's wrong with this three-year-old? He said, no, I want to be a pastor. I said, do you even know what a pastor is? What, what does a pastor do? Oh, a pastor tells other people about God. Oh, that's the right answer. Well, yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, what causes a child to want to be a pastor at that age? I don't know any 15-year-olds or 16-year-olds that want to be pastors. There might be, but I, I, I personally don't know any. Maybe God has put, a, put something in his heart. I do know that Sarah and I have an opportunity to influence him up to a certain age. I know that his teachers, his peers also will influence him. You as his church family, I'm sure you'll rub off on him somehow. And maybe his genetic makeup will speak to some of his abilities, or in the case of my family, many of his inabilities. But it's something that he has in his mind. I remember two years ago when we were worshiping at the community center, he would always run up and he'd always sit in the front row. And I think after about third or fourth time noticing that, I had to say, hey, Barnabas, you can't sit up there. He said, why? I said, well, that's for Pastor Danny and, and, and whoever is doing the MC that day. Dad, I'm going to be a pastor. Everybody's going to know me as Pastor Barnabas. I need to start practicing sitting up there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, this is really interesting. I don't know how he's going to turn out. Uh, I don't know what God's going to call him to do. I don't know when God is going to call him. I just do know that I want him to be ready when, de get, when God does call. Because God calls each of us, and God ultimately will call our children as well. And when they do, when he does, I'm sorry, my prayer is that they will be ready and they will hear God's call. So today we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 3. And if you've been in any of my uh, life groups, you know that I've been uh, doing a study on 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel starts off with Hannah going to the temple, uh, praying for a child. And uh, God actually blesses her and provides her with Samuel. And uh, in chapter 2, she sings the praises of God, how good he is. And she brings back, at the end of chapter 1, Samuel to the temple. Because she vowed that if God should give her a son, that he would de she would dedicate him to serve God for the rest of his life. And that's what she did. In uh, the, second part, uh, the middle part of uh, Samuel chapter 2, you see a contrast between Samuel, who is there ministering before the Lord, and the sons of Eli, who are part of the priesthood. They were described as being wicked, and they did very detestable things within uh, the, the priesthood. And then we get to chapter end of chapter 2, and a no-name prophet comes up, and he prophesies, against Eli and his family. And so we go into chapter 3, where we're, this is a very important transition in the history of Israel. This is a time when God did not speak to Israel, but he was going to change all that, because now he was going to have Samuel in place. And by having Samuel in place, 
God will then begin to speak to Israel again. So we start off in verse 1, and it's very interesting. It doesn't talk about God communicating to Israel. It talks about God being very uncommunicative. It says, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli's supervision. If, if you remember, uh, Samuel was brought back to the temple approximately at the age of three. We're not told how old Samuel is here. But the historian Josephus, he thinks, he thinks that Samuel's probably still a boy and that he's around the age of 12. But he ministers before the Lord. This is the third time that Samuel is described in that way. And that I think that is a, a very commendable description to have that said about you three different times. Somebody could say, Evelyn, you've been ministering before the Lord. Kristen, you've been ministering before the Lord, not just once, not just twice, but three times. And Samuel was commended for doing this three different times. Now, why was God uncommunicative, uncommunicative to Israel? I think it's because of the hardness in the hearts of, the, of Israel itself. It was probably also because of the corruption within the priesthood. In those days, if you remember the last verse in Judges, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. It's like an anarchy. People would do whatever they wanted to do. So the word of God was very rare. People did not have visions, and that's not a good thing. When God is not communicating to you, that's a bad thing. Husbands, when you go home and you find that your wives are not communicating to you, is that a good thing? When I go home and I find out Sarah's not talking to me, all right, that's bad. She probably thinks I did something wrong. Well, it's the same here. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no revelation, uh, sorry, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. In other words, when you don't hear from God, it means society is going down. God also gave the following judgment to Israel through Amos. He said, the days are coming when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. There is no greater judgment on people than God not communicating to them than God withholding his word. So back then, the word of God was rare. People did not hear from God, for he was silent. We go to the next, uh, next two verses, verses 2 and 3. It talks about Eli, and this is setting up Samuel's call. It says, One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down on the temple, or lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark was, where the ark of God was. You know, this passage right here is full of symbolism. It talks about Eli's eyes being weak. We know his eyes were weak. He couldn't even see Hannah clearly when she came into the temple. When she was described as praying fervently, she, uh, Eli thought that she was drunk. But this is also symbolic about the nearsightedness of the nation of Israel at the time. They were not seeing visions from God. When his sons were making a mockery of the priesthood, he did nothing. And then it talks about the fact that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. If you read Exodus chapter 27, verse 21, you know that the priests were required to keep the lamps burning from night until morning. And I think this is symbolic in the fact that God had not yet given up hope on Israel. You know, the word of the Lord was rare, but he had not given up full hope on them. And so we get into Samuel's calling in verse, starting at verse 4. So now we know that the priesthood was corrupt. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. 
And then God comes to Samuel and he says, or it says here, then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. You know, I love the scene because it describes Samuel as being responsive. He hears, he's obedient, he goes directly to Eli, and he runs and he says, here I am, you called me. I don't know about parents who have young kids. My nine, six, and four-year-old do not run when I call out to them. In fact, it's not the first time. Usually, I come out and I have to go look for them after calling them three or four times, but Eli, is responsive. He comes running out. And Eli said, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. And then again, the Lord calls Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. You know, the interesting thing is, when you look at this passage, we all can see who's actually doing the calling. And the Lord right? The Lord called. The Lord called. But we're reading this. We're, we're, we're having the benefit of having this written down for us. But Samuel didn't understand, nor did Eli. They didn't get it. Part of this is probably because of Eli's spiritual sluggishness. Again, we saw this with Eli and Hannah. But Samuel didn't know this, and verse 7 explains why. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, for the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. God had never spoken to Samuel this way before. Samuel was young, and he didn't realize that it was God calling him. You know, he just assumed it was Eli. And then in verse 8, it says, The Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy, so Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went, and he lay down in his place. Three times, Samuel hears his name being called. He didn't dismiss Eli as an old man. <laughs> he talks in his sleep, I'm not going to go over there this time. No. He remained respectful. He still went over there. And then God gives us a little bit of insight about Eli. Even though in chapter 2 it prophesied against him, prophesied against his family, told about how corrupt his family was, God shows us that Eli is not all bad. After all, when he found out, when he was assured that Hannah was praying, he blessed her. And maybe part of the blessing was that uh, she produced Samuel. Eli also, to his credit, did rebuke his sons, even though it was probably a little bit too late. But he did recognize the wickedness in his sons. And so when he figures out that the person that was calling Samuel, he gives Samuel some wonderful advice. He says, go back and lie down. And then the next time, respond to him and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This is the advice that I want to give to my children. This is the advice that I want to take for myself. I want to be able to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And in verse 10, at the beginning it says, the Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel Samuel. I love the fact that he calls out Samuel, Samuel, and calls his name twice. My parents never say, Dave, Dave. If, I, if they did, I know it would be pretty serious. They usually say, David. Okay, I know that's, something's coming up. But when God uses your name twice, it's something very important. He calls out to Abraham. Right before he sacrifices his son Isaac, and he says, Abraham, Abraham. And, before, and when Moses peers into the burning bush to look at God, 
God calls out to him, Moses, Moses. And this is the third time that we actually see this. And we know Abraham is the father of Israel. And we know Moses is the deliverer of Israel and the giver of the law. And now Samuel, Samuel, he is the third part of three very, individual, uh, three very important individuals in the history of Israel. This marks a, marks a turning point in how God speaks to Israel. So Samuel replies, speak, for your servant is listening. Friends, when you think about this phrase, you can almost use this as a prayer. You use this as a prayer any time you want to hear God speaking to you. It shows a desire to hear. It shows a willingness to listen. It shows a heart that says, God, I'm ready to serve you and to obey. You know, you can pray this prayer before you come down here on Sunday mornings. You think, oh, this preacher's going to be a little bit hard to understand. God, speak to me. I'm ready to listen. Before you read the word in the morning, before you pray to God in the morning, you say to him, Speak, your servant is listening. Well, Samuel does, in fact, ask God to speak, but it was probably not the message that a young boy was expecting. It probably wasn't a message that he wanted to hear. If I got this message, I knew it was something that would trouble me. And so in verse 11 it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel, that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. Imagine somebody is giving you this as a preface to the message that is to follow. You know that what, what is coming is going to be very, very important, or it could be very heavy. God says, at that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or by offering. So God now was telling Samuel, go and tell Eli this. I'm confirming the prophecy that I gave at the end of chapter 2, the prophecy that said, I promise that your family is going to serve me in the priesthood, but I'm taking that promise away from you. None of your family members are ever going to live to old age. In fact, your two sons, your two sons, they're going to die on the same day. And anybody else that lives, they're going to come before the temple groveling for food. So God broke silence, and he gave Samuel this word. The question remains, what's Samuel going to do with this? It's a very, very heavy message for me. I can't imagine getting a message where I have to go and speak against my boss, my manager, my partners. This is what Eli, or this is what Samuel has to do in giving this message to Eli. In verse 15, it says, Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel lay down until morning. It doesn't say he slept until morning. The poor kid, he was probably tossing and turning. All, this, uh, all these thoughts were crossing his mind. His, I can imagine his heart was just pounding against you know, his chest cavity. I don't want to do this. But yet he wakes up and he still continues what his um, responsibilities require. He had to open the temple doors. And then the next verse it says, he was afraid to tell Eli the vision. This confirms the fact that he was scared. He didn't want to have to do this. You know, God's calling to all of us is not always easy. He doesn't he doesn't promise us an easy calling. As Kristen knows, you know, life is full of challenges. We get called into difficult situations. We don't know why. We don't want to do it sometimes. Samuel didn't want to do this, but he did. 
And then what Eli says, I think, or sorry, it's a dialogue between Samuel and Eli. I think it's the perfect model for giving and receiving God's word. Eli asks Samuel to tell him God's word, hiding nothing. He said, Samuel, my son. And Samuel said, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you ever so severely if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. You know, this is the way that we should always approach God's word. Person, person that delivers God's word should faithfully proclaim the whole counsel of God, leaving nothing out. I know that there are many pastors out there that like to show, sugarcoat a lot of the messages. There are many in Hong Kong, and I know that. They like to tell you the positive things, but leave out or de-emphasize the negative parts of the scripture. You can't do that. Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesian elders, he said, I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. We need to be truthful. We need to be honest. And like Eli, we need to humbly receive all of God's word, even if, especially if, there are parts that we do not like. I know there are people that said, I don't like the way he preaches. I don't like it. But if God, but if he is true to the doctrine, if he is true to God's word, it's God that is speaking to you. So let's look at verse 19 and we see how God honors Samuel. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear in Shiloh, which is where the temple was, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word, and Samuel's word came to all of Israel. Samuel showed that he was a faithful prophet when he delivered the message to Eli. And I like the phrase where he says, he let none of his words fall to the ground. It means God affirmed Samuel's prophecies again and again. He would prophesy, and they came true. None of them fell to the ground. And it ends by saying that through Samuel, God's word came to all of Israel. There was a new prophet. God's word was starting to come and be released to Israel again. So what are some of the uh, takeaways from this passage? I'll give you three. The first is, God wants to communicate to us. God will call us. God will call our kids. It's our responsibility to get our kids ready. He does, you know, God is not a God who just created us and then walked away. God created us and he still wants to have a relationship with us. He still wants to give us instruction. He still wants to tell us, this is the way your life will be the happiest but we have to be willing to hear, and sometimes we don't hear well. My father uh, hates wearing a hearing aid, but he knows he doesn't hear very well. It's really funny when he gets together with his brother, uh, and both of them are very hard of hearing, and they could, be, they could be sitting next to each other, but their voices are elevated. Don't even get them on a telephone, because we don't even know what they're doing. They're just yelling at each other, but I have noticed in the last few years, um, the high frequency uh, in my left ear is starting to disappear. So sometimes uh, when I'm turned like this and Sarah's talking to me, I may not actually get it. I think it's the TV. Uh, but sometimes we just cannot hear. Part of it could be that we don't recognize God's voice. We may be like Samuel. God has never spoken to us like that before. Or maybe we're like Eli. We're just spiritually sluggish. Remember, it took Eli three times, three times before he figured out it was actually God that was speaking to Samuel. Or maybe we're just like Eli's sons. Because of our sinful disobedience, we are just unable to hear God. 
But the good thing is God is patient with us. And I like the fact that God called out to Samuel four times in this passage before Samuel finally got it. God is remarkably loving and patient. And God today speaks primarily to us through his word. He rarely speaks directly to his people. I mean, even back then, Samuel was the exception, not the rule. Most people in the Bible receive God's word in the Old Testament through prophets who were attested by God. But today we receive the word through the Bible, through the written word, and through Jesus. The book of Hebrews, it says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. We don't really know who the, who the uh, author of Hebrew is. We think it was written sometime between 50 and 70 AD, possibly by Barnabas or another um, co-worker of Paul's. But it does say, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And if that was 70 AD, and we are 2,000 years behind, we are in the last, last days. So do we want to know who God is? I think we need to look at Jesus. We need to ask him, can you hear me now? I am here as your servant. Please speak. The second thing that I think that we can take away is that fathers do, in fact, correct. I know, as, I know children don't like discipline. I know when I was young, I didn't like discipline either. And you know, before you start getting images in your head, discipline can come in different forms. It doesn't mean they have to get paddled. Different ch childs or different children respond differently to different ways of discipline. Uh, my oldest uh, responds best when I try to rationalize and speak to her. The second one uh, does require a little bit of paddling, and the third one. Um, she's very uh, emotionally manipulative, so I'm still trying to figure that one out. But, uh, you know, kids do require different types of discipline. I didn't like it when I was young, but I tell you what, there is security. There was security knowing that my father loved me enough to correct my wayward behavior. Eli's failure to correct his sons is what brought all of this calamity down on his family. He knew about their sinful behavior, and yet they, he was not able to restrain them. You know, good parents mirror the fatherhood of God. And in Hebrews, it says, the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. I hope God accepts me as his child, but that means he's going to punish me. He punishes everyone, everyone. And then in Proverbs 29, 17, it says, discipline your children and they will give you peace. I can tell you, Sarah just wants peace at home. She says, I can't, I can't take it anymore, they're so noisy. It's not just the noise, but peace is peace in your hearts that you, that you know that you've done a good job navigating your children to God's calling. Another takeaway that I was thinking about is when I was young, growing up in California, they used to teach us, you can be whatever you dreamed. Dream it and you can do it. You can achieve whatever you want. And I'm wondering, is that something that we should be taking, teaching our kids? It's not the achieving part. It's the whatever you want part. Personally, I probably don't want to teach my kids that. I want them to look for opportunities to use their God-given skills to serve other people. I want my, parent, my children to achieve whatever God wants for them. I think that's what's going to bring them their greatest happiness. You know, part of it as a parent is that um, I don't necessarily want to protect them from the pain of the world or the discomfort that cultures may, our culture may have in challenging their faith. I want them to be exposed to that. And I want, them that they, I want them to realize that they can use their gifts generously in the service of others. 
aim to achieve whatever God wants for them. Uh, there was a psychiatrist, and he, this psychiatrist was actually a uh, former prisoner of the Nazi concentration camp. He said, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, define that however you wish. Having a good job, having uh, an abundant amount of money, or happiness itself, success like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, it must follow, and it follows so as an unattended side effect of one's personal dedication to a gr cause greater than oneself. There is no cause greater than God's calling for you or God's calling for your children. And when you do hear that call, my hope is that we can say to God, Speak, for your servant is listening. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of Samuel, for his readiness to serve you when he was called. I know that for some of us, we may think you don't call us enough. Or maybe we're just not listening. We're not putting us in a position where we are able to hear you. And so I ask, Father God, that you do speak to us, and I pray that you will speak and that we will be ready, servants who are ready to listen to you. We thank you, and we thank you for all the fathers who are here with us today, and I pray a special blessing upon them, Lord, as they seek to guide their families, their children, and push them so that they are able to be sensitive enough to hear you and to follow you whenever you do speak to them. In your son's name we pray, amen.